Hi, my name is Arjaman Alvi, and I'll be presenting about the final project for fe our feedback control systems class. My teammates are Anne Lai, Michael Carmen, and Jinbo Zhu, and our professor is Katherine Johnson. So I'm just going to talk about what the main objective was for this project. The first objective was really to identify a system that can benefit from active control, and we were supposed to consult with one another based on our homework 10 submissions of our ideas and pick the best option. So what we ended up selecting was the NASA Space Shuttle Endeavor, which was authorized in August of 1987 for um, continuation and for building. And it arrived ready to go at the Kennedy Space Center on May 7, 1991. And the first flight was actually a year later from that date in 1992. And just as a fun fact, the, this was the first time that the name was of a shuttle or anything like that was selected through a national competition. So the modeling process for this launch system was really fun because we were all really interested to see how the Endeavor worked and how we could simplify the model of such a complex system. So we modeled the system after the, a time period. So we decided to go with the, modeling it from the initial launch to the point that the rocket boosters disengage. So that was kind of the time period. And we very broadly defined the system as having the force as a through variable and position as the across variable. This is a picture of the NASA Space Shuttle Endeavor. As you can see, the space shuttle is in the front with the rocket boosters in the back. And we have listed all of our specifications on the left hand side for the shuttle and the rocket boosters. So continuing on, our next part is our plan description, and we're just going to overview our design. Our ideal elements for the system are modeled here on the slide. You can see that the space shuttle and the rocket boosters are connected with the spring damper system. And our mass for the rocket and the space shuttle are listed here. And our damping coefficient and spring element are really high in value because we have such a massive system. Finally, our force through is the thrust, which is 28,000 kilonewtons. From our space shuttle ideal element model on the previous slide, we can get our complete circuit, which is shown here. And we have our transfer function listed in terms of variables and then with our coefficient values plugged in as well and our mass values. Uh, I'm my name is Jim Bojo. I'll talk about the open loop analysis. Okay, before our space shuttle goes to space, uh, gravity will influence our space shuttle moving, so we count the gravity as a disturbance. Then, uh, from the graph shown on the right, the right, uh, the curved line will be our output, the straight line will be our input. Then, until the output line will catch up the input line until 3500 uh, seconds, but we want it the output catch up input at uh, 170 uh, seconds so we decided the uh, plant dynamic is too slow for our application then we also want the space shuttle move at a constant speed so we pick ramp as our input then uh, we decided the uh, system is uh, marginally sp stable by the root herd Heart width. Uh, then uh, we will talk about that on the next slide. We decide uh, our system is uh, stable by itself or not uh, by the rules her width criteria and the Nyquist plot. Uh, then goes through the calculation on the right picture. We can see there has two zeros on the first column. That means our system is marginally stable. From the transfer function, we can see all the potent is on the laptop prime, so we can say the P is equal to zero. Then from the Nyquist plot, we get the uh, uh, one plot on the uh, my lab, it doesn't show the right things. Then uh, you should see the uh, picture on the right, it should be looks like that because our uh, zeros is on the right of the poles. Then, uh, because the uh, circle is not close, the negative one, so we can say n is equal to zero. 
uh, because z is equal to m plus p, so we can say z is equal to zero, then we can determine this is a closed loop st stable. My name is Michael Gorman, and I will be talking about the design parameters and the control mechanisms in this particular design. So we have picked three um, design parameters. The first one is that it need to be able to reject the graffiti so it can actually rip off. And the second one is that uh, we wanted our steady state error to be practically zero. And this is because of um, if it doesn't get into its desired position, we could uh, risk human life as well as not having it, you know, get into orbit as well. And pretty much cost NASA billions of dollars and we might even have the solid rocket booster not landing in the correct position. So it's pretty important for us to have the steady state to be near zero. And the last design specification is that we want a gain margin of 10 decibels and this is just to ensure robustness in case of some other disturbance that we did not take into account. This is our closed loop analysis. So at first we tried to use the EI controller but we found out that we cannot match the steady state specification with just a PI, so we use PID instead. And we use the SISO tool, and we um, find the PID, the PI and D gain values that meet our specification. Um, we can also see here that for our input RAM slope, we have a slope of 346.457 meter per second, and that is our desired output. We also have the disturbance, which is a step input of 1.9 T2 times 10 to the 7 Newton. This is our steady state error graph. As you can see, in the beginning, it has a pretty large error of about 130 meters off, but it quickly settled down to just about zero um, after 50 seconds into the simulation. This also shows that it can reject the constant disturbance of gravity. So again, our second spec is to get the steady state error to be about zero. And as I said before, um, it pretty much reads zero by 50 seconds in the simulation. And it reads like completely zero more or less by the end of the rocket launch, which is about 127 seconds. So for our third specification, we wanted a gain margin of 10 decibels, and here from the size of tool graph, we can see from the top right graph that we have a gain margin of 10.6 decibels, so it made our third and final specifications. Okay, my, my name is Anne Lai, and I will be talking about the final result. As seen below, the graph shows the input and the output position for the first 10 seconds. The red shows the input position, and the blue shows the output position and as you can see that um, the blue oscillates a little bit at first and that is shown in the um, previous error graph and you can see that as time increases uh, the blue oscillates less and therefore um, the error gets smaller. Okay so our output position does follow the desired input position. The space shuttle's altitude is 44,000 meters at 127 seconds which is when the solid rocket boosters disengage. So with that, we end our simulation of the initial launch to when the solid rocket boosters fall off. Seven, we have a go for main engine start. Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavor on a 21st century mission placing Earth back on the map. Roger roll, Endeavour. Houston's now controlling. They were rolling on a course northeast away from the Kinney Space Center toward an orbit that will take it above 95% of the world's population during its mission. Endeavour speed already 300 miles per hour. Altitude one mile. engines on Endeavour are now throttling back to two-thirds throttle to, uh, as the spacecraft prepares to go through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure and uh, go supersonic.
Endeavour, go and throttle up. Go and throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds since launch. Endeavour's three engines now back at full throttle. Endeavour speed, 1,400 miles per hour. 11 miles altitude. Eight miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Endeavour's already burned more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant. Weighs less than half of what it did at liftoff. Endeavour speed now 2,700 miles per hour, 25 miles altitude, 25 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Flight controller standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. So in conclusion, our control system does meet our design specs and theoretically, it would make the space shuttle follow the desired climb altitude input. However, this is not a very realistic control system of a space shuttle, um, just because that we can't control the rate of burning propellant, because once the um, propellant burns, it burns until it runs out. Um, it would be more realistic to control the thrust of the engine of a space shuttle itself, which can be modeled after um, the so when the solid rocket boosters fall off. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening and mission success.